What's good, everyone? Welcome to today's episode of What the Fintech, the podcast for fintech professionals who are ready to shape the future of our industry with innovation and inclusion. I'm your host, Nicole Casperson, and today's episode hits a little different. I'm doing something totally new because I'm not trying to leave any gaps in your fintech knowledge. That's why twice a month, I'll be hosting episodes where I go over the latest news, insights, and trends in fintech via shorter, newsier, quick buy episodes. Sound good? All right. Well, let's get started with the top six fintech stories you need to know about. As a journalist who has covered the finance sector over the last five years, I've had the opportunity to interview and engage with some of the best minds in the space. Leaving big bank earnings reports to the boring traditional media firms, I'll focus on the tech-savvy apps, digital investing platforms, challenger banks, and payment giants to drive relevant content that looks forward to disruption instead of fearing it. I'm Nicole Kasperson, fintech journalist, and this is What the Fintech. To kick things off, let's talk about what could come of the power struggle between the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, a.k.a. the CFPB, and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, a.k.a. the FDIC, over a request for comment on the Bank Merger Act. Don't you just love it when regulators tussle? It started when FDIC board members Martin Gruberg and Rohit Chopra, who is also director of the CFPB, posted a joint statement on the CFPB's website on December 9th, seeking public comment on the Bank Merger Act. In case you don't know, the Bank Merger Act basically stops the FDIC from approving bank mergers that would result in a monopoly within the banking business in the U.S. Why does this matter, you may ask? Because bank merger transactions have massively changed the landscape of the finance industry over the last 30 years, The way mergers have carried out means that the total number of banks has been reduced over the years, making the ones that merge richer and richer. This makes the few banking options we have successful not because they're great, but simply because they exist. Here's a data point for you. In 1990, there were more than 15,000 banks. That was reduced to roughly 4,800 banks by 2020. This means a lot less choice for consumers and a lot more power and money consolidated in the hands of a small group of traditional financial institutions. On one side of the argument, anyone who wants to stop this from being investigated is likely to be met with criticism from those of us who advocate for a democratic and transparent financial industry. On the other hand, Focusing too much energy and attention on bank mergers has been criticized as an attempt to preserve an out-of-date and increasingly irrelevant financial institution. Instead, maybe regulators should be putting all that energy into innovating forward-facing financial services that embrace the fast-changing world. For example, crypto regulation, which leads us right into our second story. The next 24 months could offer some real progress on regulatory clarity for cryptocurrencies. At least we all hope so. And here's one sign of hope. Last month, the U.S. House Committee on Financial Services heard testimony from leading crypto executives to discuss what regulations should be applied to the growing industry. The hearing included members from Paxos, Bitfury, Circle, and Coinbase. Surprisingly, representatives from Meta, aka Facebook, and Tether were absent. Here's the thing we all need to remember. Just like any area of investing, cryptocurrency carries serious downside risks, as well as offers potentially significant gains. So the conversation is a great starting point. It's important because Congress really needs to be led by future-facing experts. Otherwise, the likelihood is that the unfit-for-purpose analog policies will be used in a cut-and-paste fashion in the cryptosphere, which would totally, for a lack of a better word, suck. Moving on. For our next story, let's talk about how UK challenger bank Monzo made a massive comeback recently. Monzo just raised its valuation to $4.5 billion and is adding 100,000 new customers a month now passing 5 million total users. This is a huge rally after a downturn from the platform during the height of the pandemic. Why am I bringing this up? Because Monzo demonstrates that UX and customer pleasing features are what really matters today in FinTech. It's all about the features, baby. 
In fact, Monzo has been voted the second most loved brand in the UK and remains at number one for customer satisfaction. Snappy features like easily splitting bills with friends and attracting more users are making investors pay attention. The turnaround for Monzo shows that putting the customer first can pay massive dividends to the tune of billions of dollars. These are the kind of future-facing developments that will fuel the finance industry going forward. Up next, let's talk about payments because it's impossible to imagine a world 10 years from now where seamless and integrated payment options are not the norm. In fact, a December 2021 report from OpenPaid forecasts that the embedded finance boom is going to be led by, surprise, surprise, embedded payments. Think of the last time you used Grubhub. You choose, ordered, and paid for your food all within the app. Now imagine having this service available with lending or investing. And the trend is going international. The report found 96% of European brands confirmed that they'll be prioritizing embedded payments over the next five years. And guess what's driving the accelerated rollout of embedded finance options? Customer demand. This is another area where we can see the digital transformation of financial services reinventing customer experience. Banking as a service allows customers to complete the full sales cycle all in one app. It's easy, intuitive, and personal. And it's a huge area of growth. In 2020, there were 700,000 open banking payments. Between February and August 2021, there were 11 million. Let that sink in. Next, let's look at how real estate meets fintech, because that's an area I'm super interested in seeing grow in 2022 and beyond. Fintech could make home ownership more attainable for more people, but it has to be done right. The two sectors do merge through the home financing app HomeTap, which raised $60 million in December. The new series of funding brings its total to $95 million since its inception in 2017. CEO Jeffrey Glass claims they have grown consistently quarter after quarter, even throughout the pandemic. HomeTap is interesting because it lets users literally tap into the equity of a home without needing mortgage-type loans. Intriguing, right? The company invests in the projected future value of a customer's house in exchange for a lump sum payment. It's not a loan, so there are no repayments. But here's the catch. After 10 years, you have to either buy out HomeTap, sell your home, or refinance with a traditional mortgage. It could be a great solution, but more likely, homeowners will be forced to sell their homes or take on a new loan, since the massive appreciation we're seeing in real estate markets makes it unlikely that most homeowners will be able to actually buy out HomeTap. It'll be interesting to see how this one plays out. For our last story, we're talking about financial services for small to medium-sized businesses that continue to show massive growth potential, especially across the globe. In fact, fintech company Modify has just raised $145 million in debt financing and offers services to for small to medium-sized businesses that investors would be wise to pay attention to. Here's why. After launching in 2018, the company has quadrupled its business year over year. The $145 million will be used to roll out further services to meet the ballooning demand from small to medium-sized businesses for simple digital solutions to finance and manage their international trade. Ultimately, fintech is one of the most exciting and rapidly changing industries in existence, but it is also becoming a great equalizer for consumers outside of the U.S. For example, India's GDP is forecast to grow by $950 billion by 2025 due to fintech alone, creating 21 million jobs. One of the core outcomes of this? Massively enhanced financial inclusion. And you know how we love that here. Moreover, a recent report from Australia India Council suggests that investing in fintech in India could offer as much as a 9% higher return on investment than the global average over the next several years, which is also something you may wish to consider in your 2022 investment strategy. All right, fintech fam, that's all for this special episode of What the Fintech. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in. If you love this episode, be sure to hit that subscribe button. You can find me on all your favorite podcast platforms. Until next time, talk to you all soon and happy 2022.